Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, how close can two aircraft actually get to each other as they're flying en route? What happens if they get too close and what rules are there? Stay tuned. Point three, one zero, one six, three one right, right on. Third line, three one right. Delta 260, two sixty. This video is brought to you together with Skillshare. Now, I have gotten a lot of questions, guys, about what keeps me going as a YouTuber. How come that I can come up with new things to talk about every week? And what's, what is in it? What does it take to become a good YouTuber? Now, one course in Skillshare that I would really like you to, you to check out, if you're interested in doing that, is a course about authentic YouTubing with um, Sorel Amore. All right? It is a fantastic course that shows exactly the kind of values that I try to follow myself all the time and that you guys should really think about following if you want to start your own YouTube channel. But if that's not for you, Skillshare has literally thousands of high quality video courses in pretty much any subject that you can imagine. Anything from photography or creative writing or pretty much anything. So the 501st of you who uses this link here below, you'll get two months of premium Skillshare membership absolutely for free, which means that you can go out and you can check out all of these courses yourself. And I can guarantee you that you will find something that you find fascinating. So go down now, click on the link, try it out for two months and see if there's something for you. And like I said, check out that course with um, Sorel Amore. It is really, really, it really lifted my spirits when I was watching it. Right guys, so um, I've gotten a lot of questions about how close can, can aircraft actually get to each other, right? A lot of questions from people who are afraid of flying, nervous flyers, and those are the kind of people that I really, really want to help. And I understand that if you're sitting as a passenger, you're a little bit nervous to start with, and then you look out through the window and out there suddenly you see another aircraft just swooshing by, and it's really, really quick when it does so. I understand that that can feel a bit random, like how close can these aircraft actually get? Is there ever any risk involved in this? So that's what we're going to be talking about today, guys. Uh, I'm going to do this in five different steps. So there are five different things that I want you to remember about separation between aircraft. So the first thing I want to talk about are the risks. What risks do we actually take into account when it comes to separation between aircraft? Well, the first thing is what you think about, which is collision. All right. Is there a risk of two aircraft crashing into each other? Um, and how do, we, how do we work that risk? How do we mitigate against that risk? Obviously, aircraft today are very, very fast moving machines. At altitude, we move at around 850 kilometers per hour. So that means that if two aircraft are on a collision course, we will meet each other with a mind boggling 1,700 kilometers per hour. Now, it's very, very hard to see a little white speck at the horizon and realize that that's an aircraft and having that move against you with 1700 kilometers per hour, it will become a very big white dot very quickly. So that would lead you to believe that we have to have a system in force to make sure that that is not the case, that we can't be moving towards each other uh, at the same altitude. There needs to be rules. We'll get to that in a second. So that's the first risk, collision risk. The second risk is um, something that you might not think about as much, which is wingtip vortexes, wake turbulence. Now, I've done a video about wake turbulence before. You can check it out. It's quite old, but still good. Uh, but what you need to understand is that any aircraft that take out lift from its wings does so partially because of a difference in pressure between the underside of the wings, where there's a higher pressure, and the upper side of the wings, where there's a lower pressure. Now, whenever you have a difference in pressure, the air is always going to try to equalize that pressure difference. So the air will try to escape from below the wings to go to the top of the wings. And when it does so, it creates vortexes at the wing tips. 
Now these vortexes, they can pose a significant risk to any aircraft that comes behind. Because if you're flying in to air that's turning around, it can also turn the aircraft around. Okay, or it can get it into an unusual attitude very, very quickly. So that's the second risk that we have to take into account when we talk about separating aircraft. So if we start off with when we're still on the ground, when we're about to take off, right? So that's number two, takeoff. Um, the aircrafts are divided into different categories depending on their weight. And also to a certain extent, depending on their aerodynamic characteristics. So for example, an aircraft that weighs more than 560 tons is considered a super heavy aircraft. So it's in the super weight category, which means that it is creating enormous wake turbulence vortexes behind it. Now, if you are between 130 tons and uh, 560 tons, you are then in the heavy category. Okay. The heavy category includes uh, aircraft like, for example, the Boeing 747, uh, a not fully loaded Airbus 380, as an example. All right. Now, in between 7 tons and 130 tons, you have the medium category. And that's where the Boeing 737 and the Airbus 320 comes in, for example. Below 7 tons, you have the light category, where you have your general aviation, uh, most of the uh, private jets, and, and so on. So, depending on what aircraft is the one that's taken off first, the other aircraft is going to have to wait depending on you know, the size. So, for example, if, if I'm sitting in my Boeing 737 and I have a heavy aircraft that's taking, taking off ahead of me, so a Boeing 747, for example, well, in that case, I will have to stop my, start my uh, stopwatch when uh, the 747 starts rolling, and then I have to wait a full two minutes before I can take off. And the reason for that is because the wake turbulence from the 747 is not going to just stay behind where the wings were. It's going to fall down slowly and then it's going to dissipate out towards the sides. There are risks when there's crosswind, for example, that the, the um, wake turbulences might fall down and instead of going out to the side might actually linger a little bit longer. So that's something that we have to take into account. But Two minutes has been shown to be enough for those, wing, uh, for those vortexes not to be dangerous anymore. Now, it could be as much as three or even four minutes sometimes if we have a super uh, category aircraft in front of us. That would be a fully loaded Airbus 380, for example. All right? Similar waiting time comes in for light aircraft that's following us as well. Um, but between medium to medium, there is no minimum distance, right? When it comes to medium to medium, so let's say I take off after another 737, then there is a distance for collision that is more important. So generally speaking, we're looking at a minute or two anyway, around a minute or so, in order for the preceding aircraft to have enough kind of horizontal distance away before the next aircraft can take off. And that's especially important if those two aircraft, if we are departing on the same route. So if we're flying on the same departure route, well then I might have to wait a little bit longer in order to achieve that separation in between each other when we get up onto altitude later on, All right? Now when it comes to smaller aircraft, so let's say that I am about to take off and we have some light Cessnas, uh, visual flying Cessnas around, then generally what air traffic control does is that they tell these Cessnas to go out into predetermined uh, holding points, which are generally a beam the tower on the left or the right side of the airport, and tell them to stay there, to be out of the way, so that when I take off on an instrument flight, I won't suddenly have a Cessna crossing the center line in front of me. So air traffic control, as with everything when it comes to these rules, plays an enormous role here, right? Very, very important. But sometimes air traffic control doesn't have radar. In that case, it becomes a little bit trickier. Then we do something called procedural separation, which is very, very largely built on timings and position reports over predetermined uh, radio fixes, All right? With me so far? 
Cool. So that's takeoff. And like I said, in most cases, the biggest separation has to do with wake turbulence there because the aircraft will be producing more wake turbulence when they're heavy, as in takeoff, or when they're flying slow, like during the landing. Right? Now, then after we've taken off and we're climbing out, uh, air traffic control will make sure that we don't have any conflicting traffic close to us during our climb. And that has to do with distances horizontally in the same uh, plane, right? So as a general rule, when we're climbing out and also when we are at altitude, we don't want any other aircraft to be closer to us at the same altitude than five nautical miles. We also don't want anyone closer than a thousand feet above or a thousand feet below us, right? But then you might ask yourself, but how do we know if you are flying at flight of a 350, for example, and you have opposite traffic coming a thousand feet above, how, how do, are these flight levels actually assigned? Because it can't be random, can it? And you're right, no. Actually, we have something called the half circle rule. And this means that when we are flying and we're filing our flight plans, we're looking at what direction we are flying. And aircraft that are flying in a uh, predominantly eastward direction, so between uh, zero degrees and 180 degrees, they are flying eastward and they're flying on odd flight levels. So a flight of a 350, a flight of a 370, a flight of a 390, a flight of a 410, for example. Now, if you're flying predominantly westward, so between 180 degrees and 359 degrees, well then, you are flying on even levels. Flight of a 300, 320, 340, 360, 380, and so on. And that is, I should say, if we're flying inside of what we call RVSM airspace, that's reduced vertical separation minima, okay? So air traffic control will assign us these flight levels, they will approve these flight levels, but on a general kind of rule base, this is how these flight levels are being assigned. So that, that makes it absolutely sure that we are not colliding into each other, okay? Right. So... What about wake turbulence en route then? Is wake turbulence a threat there as well? In fact, it is. Because uh, even though we are not taking out as much lift as we do during takeoff and landing when we're en route, the same thing applies. We're still producing these wake turbulence vortexes. And those, t um, those vortexes, they fall bet between 300 to 500 feet per minute. So this means that uh, if if I am flying at, let's say I'm flying at flight level 350, that's 35,000 feet. And I see on my TCAS display, which we'll get to in a second, that I have an aircraft that is 1,000 feet above me and is crossing my track about two minutes ahead of me. Well, then I know that here there might be a risk, okay? Because I know that the vortexes from that aircraft that is 1,000 feet above me, which is two minutes away, um, will be descending with between three to 500 feet per minute. So potentially in two minutes, those vortexes could have descended down to my level. And that means that I might fly through this once. And I don't know, you might have noticed this sometimes. If you're out flying and it's all calm, everyone is going around their business, the, uh, fl the cabin crew is sending out, giving out their coffee and whatever. And all of a sudden you have just a very sudden shudder. It comes from nowhere, no warnings, no belts on or anything that is most likely wake turbulence, okay? Now, bigger aircraft, like medium up to heavy aircraft, they can get into bad wake turbulence at altitude, but generally speaking, it would be like that. It would be a sudden shudder that might scare someone, especially if you're a nervous flyer, but it will just go off like that. However, if, for example, you're flying a private jet and you come into the wake turbulence en route behind a Airbus 380, it can actually turn the aircraft completely upside down, all right? And it has happened. There has been incidents where this has happened. So we have to take this into account. There's another thing that we do when we, the pilots are sitting on route is actually monitoring the traffic around us using our TCAS panel that we see on our navigation display, kind of judging, okay, is there a risk for wake turbulence with the crossing traffic that's ahead? Now, air traffic control does also think about this 
but they have a lot of things to think about. So there is a chance that they might not think about it. And in that case, we can do things like, for example, ask for a vector at a turn to get more uh, distance for the vortexes to fall. Uh, if we're flying straight behind someone, we can ask for a uh, track that is parallel. Maybe just turn one nautical mile to the right and follow the track parallel in order to avoid the, uh, the vortexes. But at least we can put the fasten seatbelt sign on. So, you know, to make sure that the passengers are sitting down in case we would pass through an area of wake turbulence. Right? Good. So that's en route, right? Then we will start descending in towards our landing airport. Now, this is where we come up to kind of a bottleneck, especially if we are flying into a very busy airport, like for example, Manchester, or Heathrow, Los Angeles, um, Berlin, anything like that. Air traffic control knows that they have only a limited amount of time for us to land, right? There is maybe 15 aircraft coming in that is scheduled to land within a very specific time frame. So this means that air traffic control can, at a very early stage, start telling us to slow down. If they see that there's a risk that we're going to have to end up in a holding pattern um, over the airport that we're going to, well then we can start slowing down early in order to fit us into a traffic pattern. And once again, when you get in towards an airport, the thing that's going to determine how close you can be to the aircraft ahead is going to be the wake category. So generally we aim at about five nautical miles, about two to three minutes in between. That can be reduced if there are similar aircraft like 2737 for example. But if we're looking at the preceding aircraft being a heavy aircraft like a Boeing 747 and even actually the Boeing 757 which is not actually in the weight category of being heavy but because of its aerodynamical shape it actually produces some huge vortexes. Well in that case we're looking at at least three minutes in between or about five nautical miles on a landing, okay? But if I'm coming in behind the 737, well then it can become even less than that. Two and a half miles is not uncommon. Uh, they try to basically squeeze us in as quickly as possible. Um, there is even what we call a land after clearance. So this means that we can be cleared to land after an aircraft that is still not vacated the runway. If we are on a very long runway, if we have good weather, so there's a you know that we can clearly see the preceding traffic. Uh, it's daytime, so never during nighttime. And air traffic control has approved it. You can do land after clearance. So that means me touching down as the other aircraft is leaving the runway. Okay. If we haven't received a landing clearance. So if I'm coming in really, really tight and we haven't received a landing clearance, the latest point at which we need to have a landing clearance is when we pass the threshold, right? If we haven't received the landing clearance by then, we have to execute a go around and a go around I've been talking about in a different podcast. So if you're interested in knowing that, especially if you're a nervous flyer, check out the link up here, All right? Good. So these are some of the rules that we're following to make sure that we never get close to each other and also that we don't get into um, to wake turbulence. But what happens if someone breaks this rule or if there's a misunderstanding? Let's say an aircraft uh, reads back the wrong altitude and air traffic control doesn't catch that the clearance has been read back incorrectly. Well then you can get into a situation where you face up with another aircraft too close to you. That has happened uh, there was a famous incident in Germany, an accident in Überlingen, where, uh, where this kind of misunderstanding happened um, and two aircraft actually did crash into each other. And after that, there was a lot of stringent rules enforced. Um, TCAS, as you know it, the Traffic Collision and Avoidance System, was, uh, became mandatory. And also there was, um, there was rules that told pilots that if you have a contradicting information from the TCAS information that you get from the aircraft and from air traffic control, you have to follow the aircraft, right? Because the aircraft, the TCAS system, which is telling us how to deal with a situation like that, is based on one transponder in my aircraft, another transponder in the opposite aircraft, and they talk to each other. So there is minimum chance of any misunderstanding there. 
This is why it's so important that if you get a TCAS resolution advisory, you have to follow the resolution advisory. Even though air traffic control screams at you that you have to maintain altitude or descend or whatever, you follow what TCAS tells you. Okay, so there are very, very good um, procedures in force when it comes to these kind of anti-collision systems. And if you guys are interested in watching how I did this together with a colleague in a simulator where I show you exactly what to look for, how it sounds, how it feels, well then get the Mentor Aviation app and get the TCAS collection. All right, I think it's only $2 or something like that. And you'll be able to see in 360 on your mobile device, you can scroll around the cockpit and you can see how I deal with it, how the pilot monitoring deals with it, what kind of, of communication is going on with that graphic control. So check that out if you're interested in that. And that's what I had, guys. Um, I hope that answers some of your questions. Um, if you are a nervous flyer out there, if you want more information about things like this, well then feel free to send me messages here in the, uh, in the description of the video, obviously. Or if you have the Mentor Aviation app, you can just go to Submit Feedback. That will send me a message. Because I want to know what you guys want me to explain. Right? I understand that there's a lot of you out there who are sitting and you're really either terrified of flying or really nervous about getting on that aircraft. And I think that with some proper information, you will become more in control. You will feel much better if you understand what all those noises are, why we do things the way we do. So please contact me and let me know how I can help you feel better about getting on your next trip together with your family. All right? If you haven't, make sure that you have subscribed to the channel, that you've highlighted a little notification bell because I do live streams from now and then. I do some extra like spontaneous videos like I did two days ago about me being in Bergamo during the, um, the outbreak there. Uh, and if you haven't highlighted a little bell, you might not get notified when I send out a video like that. So subscribe to the channel, highlight the notification bell, have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are, take care of yourself and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.